Okay, so who would like to go first? Orla has the microphone. In a minute, we're just And she is going to pass it to you. So, let's see, who would like to go first with the first question? Christina, so just shout out nice and loud so Brian can hear and everyone else too. Hi guys, I'm Christina. Christina. Um, so we, we have some Americans at our table as well, so we were talking a lot about like the different political structures that we both have um, and kind of just struggling with a way of, of interpreting as Christians how we are supposed to interact with the politics of our countries while also like are we supposed to be outside of the politics or how do you think we should be engaging with those situations as vastly different as they are with Ireland trying to move away from church and state being the same thing and Americans still having quite def definite parties based on faith. Um, how do we interact or should we interact at all or should we be trying to create a, just the politics of the kingdom of God and living by those? Yeah, I think I understand the question. I don't think there's any one answer. I think it varies from time and place. So I think we have to constantly be evaluating what does our political expression of a primary commitment to Jesus Christ look like in this moment. And I think it varies from time to time. I'm certainly not going to say I know what it should look like in an Irish context. In an American context, I have been so deeply disturbed that at least one of the major parties, well, the evangelicals in America, and that would be more or less my tradition, have become the de facto religious wing of the Republican Party. And it goes all the way back to the 19, well, about 1980, and the issue of abortion, and evangelicals lined up with the Republican Party but then they uncritically accepted everything so that the pro-life position is to be anti-abortion, pro-war, pro-death penalty, pro-proliferation of guns, and it's absurd. So I've thought that in my particular context, if I can just pull people back from political engagement and simply have a more humble stance within the community seeking to embody the politics of Jesus, but I think that's that's that would be in my context. I'm not saying that's true anywhere else. And my wife and I don't even agree on this, you know. And <laughs> so, so let's get the mic to Perry. <laughs> yeah, you really should, actually. Was that a request or a <laughs> Do you um, want to say something, Perry? Perry doesn't. No, she's okay. Okay. So next question. Over here to Ferg. And briefly, for I guess for Christianity and empire to effectively be in bed together for the last 1700 years or so, it, it feels like it would have to be justified through scripture. So I'm wondering, do you feel there are certain theological pillars that may need to be deconstructed to help people along the way? Did you say you feel like it is justified by scripture or some, some feel that it's justified? Well, most, well, to be able to teach certain things in church, you would have to point to scripture and say, oh, well, it says this to back up your system, right. your empirical system. And so I'm wondering, are there certain theological ramifications that we just grew up with that assume are true? Right, I think so. I think we have to become very serious about Jesus announcing embodying and acting the kingdom of God. And the kingdom of God needs to be understood not as uh, heaven, even though Matthew's gospel, it's called the kingdom of heaven, but the kingdom of God, kingdom of heaven, same thing. But that it is God's alternative vision for human society founded around Jesus Christ. And it is not subservient to a violence-based political system that has been in play from Abel, from Cain and Abel onward. But Jesus is offering something else. And, and the book that, we'll, that we can really use to critique empire is the most troublesome of books. And that's the book of Revelation that in America has been used for all kinds of nefarious things. But it's actually the best book. It's very pertinent. Because what the 
book of Revelation quite simply is, it is a prophetic critique of the Roman Empire and thus all empires. And it is the presentation of the, tr the, the, the surprising triumph of the lamb over beast. So that the kingdom of God is without coercion. We persuade by love, witness, spirit, reason, rhetoric, and if need be martyrdom, but not by force. Of course, we have been conditioned by 17 hundred years of Christendom to think that that's illusory. It's, it's impossible. It can't happen. And yet uh, the, the community of the baptized are to in fact embody that. And the church more or less did this successfully for 300 years. And so um, I think what we are entering into is a post Christendom period. And now we're going to discover what comes next. And we're going to have to figure out what it means to be the body of Christ after the death of Christendom. And for those that are holding out for some sort of hope of resurrection of Christendom, it ain't going to happen. Those days are over. It doesn't mean, though, that I've lost, that I think the gates of hell have prevailed against the church. But I think the church is going to have to rethink what it means to be the body of Christ in the world. And I think I could use, personally, I think, Ferg, I use scripture all day long to do that. I, yes, yes, I think I can use scripture to critique empire and uh, the politics of force as opposed to the politics of Christ. Next. Over here, we're just, hang on one sec until we get the microphone to you. I think it's fair to say as we get in the mic there, you can also have differentiation of interpretation around certain books. So you can of have course. prophetic and literal and so. Uh, see the pastor trying to justify the Bible? Okay, so <laughs> next. <laughs> My name is Helen. Um, What's I, it, Helen? Helen, Helen. I was interested in the last question and it's kind of a tie on from that. If we read redemptive history across the grain, as Tim Keller would say, we tend to only see the spiritual kingdom. But if we read it up the grain leading to the branches, we see history as a story. And when I say as a story, what I mean is God is sovereign. That's what I found, Brian, a little just if I can say it, disappointing in what you said, I didn't hear the tension of sovereignty and man's responsibility. In other words, God's sovereignty has allowed empire. He used the Assyrians in order to punish his own people. So in a sense, reading the story going up the grain to the top, this is all, when I say allowed, I'm not saying that it's not awful, but the recognition that we are depraved is a truth and that we are to live, as Jesus called us, comes down to obedience. And we all have our little empires. I have my empire, I don't want to, but I am a little emperor. In fact, everyone has idols, as Calvin said, we're all in the factory of idols. Is that not true? It's not only empire on the large scale, but on the small scale. And can we just catch the tension of sovereignty and man's responsibility? God is sovereign, sovereign enough to allow all things. And he allows the Assyrian Empire. He also allows the Holocaust and Hiroshima. And so I want to be very careful about saying, thus and this thing has happened, therefore it falls under the realm of God's sovereignty. Yeah, you can say that about the Assyrian Empire, but you would then also have to say the same thing about Hiroshima and the Holocaust. And so, yes, God is sovereign. And in his sovereignty, he has chosen to work in cooperation with people, not to override. And so he bears witness and we choose to follow or not. And then I understand the wrath of God as divine consent to our own rebellious will. That as long as we set ourselves in opposition to the will of God, the truth is that that will always boomerang back on us. We're more punished by our sins than for our sins. And so even in the midst of, yes, uh, Assyrian domination, uh, or, or, we, can, we can seek to live out faithfully and we can, we can find comfort in the fact that, uh, that he that sits upon the throne is worthy. But neither will I be uh, quick to say that because God is sovereign, everything in the universe or everything in human history happens according to his plan, because I, I simply don't believe that. But that is a tension. It is a tension, yeah. yeah. 
Thank you. James. <coughs> Thanks. I uh, really enjoyed the talk. I just want to uh, ask around the idea that there might be, in a modern world, things that are in fact more powerful than, than states. Um, so mm. we have a number of businesses now, we have individuals uh, who uh, haven't been paying their taxes among other things. But that those are, uh, <laughs> those might reflect power structures um, that are more powerful than governments to control. And I was wondering if you could speak to how Christians should relate to power generally. Um, so it might be that, as our previous question asked, there are other power structures in society beyond those of just the Yeah, I completely structure. agree. You're the economics professor though, right? So, law. <laughs> law, okay. Uh, yeah, I, I just haven't developed my thinking in that area real strong or not with much articulation, but I completely agree that we may be coming toward the end of the dominance of the nation state. It still has that appearance, but what's really behind it is the economic interests and the uh, multinational, corporations, and, and that's, that is new enough as a phenomenon that I haven't completely learned how to address all of that, but I will say, yeah, it's part of the beast too. And the Christian position towards power is that, well, um, it, it, you remember that on the eve of Jesus' suffering, his disciples had a debate among themselves as to which would be the greatest. And prior to that, uh, James and John had petitioned Jesus. They said, well, as you come into your kingdom, because that, they were on their way to Jerusalem for Jesus to become king. They believed he was the Messiah, the Mashiach, the anointed one. And all of that was true. They just didn't understand that his coronation was going to be by crucifixion and that his throne was going to be a cross. But so still, James and John come and they say, we want to sit on your right and on your left when you come into your kingdom. We want to be Secretary of Defense and Secretary of State in your cabinet. That's essentially what they're asking. And Jesus says, you don't know what you're asking. Uh, are you able to drink my cup of suffering? Are you able to be baptized in the baptism of pain? And I was like, yeah, we're able. And Jesus said, well, in fact, you will eventually drink that cup and receive that baptism. But to be on my right and my left is not for me, but it's for whom it's prepared. And of course, it turned out to be those two criminals, those two revolutionaries that were crucified on either side of Jesus. So without knowing what they were asking, James and John were essentially asking to be crucified with Jesus. Then in the upper room during the Last Supper, uh, when the dispute again erupts about who should be considered the greatest, Jesus said, look, among the Gentiles, among the pagan powers, it's the mighty ones that lord it over, but it will not be so among you. And Jesus in, enacts the kingdom of God by washing their feet. And he said, this is what power looks like in the kingdom of Christ. It's, it's humility. It's willingness to serve. It is, willing, it is willingness to suffer and die because on the cross we discover that we, dis we see a God who would rather die than kill his enemies. And so that is, I think, our posture toward power among the community of the baptized. Good answer. Yep, over here, Laura. Thanks. Hi, I'm just wondering if you could um, maybe throw a little light on how, in your own congregation, that whole idea of how you deal with power actually plays out or gets lived out on a day-to-day -day basis. Is that possible? Interpretation, let me just say. Uh, how in your local con That's a great Dublin accent, we love it. Um, how does this whole idea of power play out practically in your own congregation when you're teaching on it and the application of it? Oh, man. Good <laughs> question. Well, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm as forthcoming in my church right in the middle of America. I'm in Missouri. If you don't know where that is, just imagine and right in the middle. And it's very conservative. Uh, some of you know Jason Upton. I think he's around here somewhere. And Jason left me a voicemail the other day. He said, Brian, you'd be edgy. You'd be controversial if you were in Boston. You're in Missouri. How do you get away with this? <laughs> and I said, well, I, who said I was getting away with anything? Uh, yeah, I mean, it, it's difficult. And it's challenging. And it's, it's highly controversial. And it... it I mean, when I first began to preach like this, I lost a thousand members, so there. <laughs> but 
you know, I have to, you can't unknow what you know and be true to yourself. And so uh, I let Jesus do as much of the heavy work as I can. I just keep, I preached for six months on the Sermon on the Mount. And nearly every Sunday, a church member would come up to me afterwards and say, are you saying that? And I would just stop them. I would say, I'm not trying to say anything. I'm trying to let Jesus speak for himself from the Sermon on the Mount. What do you think he's saying? And so I can tell the horror stories of have losing a thousand members, but I can also tell the good stories of people really being transformed and seeing the kingdom. Jesus told Nicodemus, unless you're born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. Jesus was not saying, unless you pray a sinner's prayer, you can't go to heaven when you die. That's not what he was saying. He was saying, unless you, and he uses this idiom, born from above. You know, when musicians are re rehearsing a song, they'll maybe rehearse one part of it, and then maybe the band leader will say, all right, guys, let's take it from the top. Okay, that's, that's the idea of take it from the... Jesus is saying to Nicodemus, Nicodemus, you've got to take it from the top, rethink everything, or you'll never even be able to perceive the government, the reign, the rule, the kingdom of God. Even though it's right here, you won't see it unless you're willing to rethink everything. You know, I admire Peter and, Paul, Peter and James and John and Andrew, those fishermen that left their nets to follow Jesus. But I'm really, I admire even more deeply Nicodemus, who was willing as a tenured professor to rethink his entire understanding of the kingdom of God in the light of Christ. That was a very difficult and daring move, but he did it. And so the good news for Perry and I, as we have pastored our church, one, one local church for 34 years, coming up on 35 years, is that we have a large group of people that have been able to rethink everything, even living in the heart of a military superpower that likes to claim to be, you know, something that God has raised up. We have hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people that are rethinking this in the light of Christ and seeing the kingdom of God. And so that's what we're doing. But, it, but it, it's, it's, in my context, it's not done without pain. It's not done without suffering. If, if I just wanted to be like a church growth guy like I was, I used to get invited to all kinds of church growth conferences. Not anymore. Uh, but I get invited to Jesus conferences. And so that's good. I'm just nervous that you're speaking in Holy Spirit. <laughs> no. And a thousand people left. We're going to grow the church. With that. <laughs> so we've run out of time. I have one more question for you, though. And that is, um, why are you voting for Donald Trump, then? <laughs> uh, guys, can we just give Brian a round of applause? Oh, what <laughs> here in, you know, the world of Western Europe, seeking out perspective asylums. <laughs> we may need to apply for political refugee status, so. Can we give a round of applause, Brian?